So it is uh, Family Sunday, and what that means is we do things a little bit different, so it's more fun. And, and since we're trying to make things more fun, I figured today we would dive into uh, reading uh, Matthew in the way that we've been reading it, in a more studied way, in a way that lets us define words and use grammar and talk about history, because I know kids love history, right? History. History. Hit. No? Okay. But we've been going through it that way, and if that's not your thing, that's fine, Right? We, we, we've already recognized that sometimes we do church differently because it helps someone else connect with God. And to someone else in this room, maybe they are a history buff. Maybe they love diving into things that are thousands of years old because that helps them connect with God better. Great. If that's you, perfect. You're in the right place. If that's not you, that's okay. You're still in the right place because there's still something here for you today. But also, you get to realize that one of the things you're doing this morning is you're serving someone else in the room by being happy with a church that is not exactly how you would make it, because you know that it helps someone else connect with God. And, and so we're going to be talking about Matthew 5, as we've been doing, where Jesus walks up on a mountain and, and starts teaching the new ways that we should live. And Matthew shapes it in the same way that, uh, that Exodus talks about Moses going up on the mountain and bringing down Ten Commandments. So like, we're, 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 we're looking at it from that way that Jesus is trying to give you the ways to live a new and better life, the ways to trust him, the ways to follow after him, that something about his teachings are, are giving you the way to follow after him and live like him. And we've been saying that he's not just giving simple commands. He's not just saying, do this rule and you'll be on God's nice list. He's been trying to get you to understand a deeper righteousness that transforms not just a couple of your actions, but your heart and your mind and your spirit. And so today, we're, we're going to make big church a little bit more like youth group or kids group where we ask some questions or small group if you're in a small group. And I'm going to ask you to finish the sermon today. I have some things written down, but if we don't get to them, that's great. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want you to answer this question. What is the deeper righteousness that Jesus is talking about? So if throughout the service you feel like you have a boom, there's a great thought. Maybe that's your thought. Maybe that's the Holy Spirit's thought. Whatever that is, I want you to write that down so we can save it. Another way of phrasing that is just, like, what are we, sorry, this side is the only one that has it. Uh, another way of phrasing that is just, what are we actually supposed to do? Like, like, the, the, what the deeper righteousness is, is just what you're actually supposed to do. So let's, let's read the passage together today. Here's what it says. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven or God's throne, or by the earth, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. He closes, can we just put that last verse on the screen for a second? He closes in like a, like a pretty strong word, doesn't he? He, he, he says that, that, that you are not supposed to make promises. You're just supposed to say yes or no. Anything less than that is like the evil one. You know, the evil one. That snake that was in that tree who made good things look like they were bad things and bad things look like they were good things. That there is something about that that is, is twisted, that subtly twists the truth that says, did God really say? Did God really say you're not allowed to keep eat any tree in the garden? Like somehow to Jesus, promises are snake-like. They're twisted and different and make good things look bad and bad things look good, but saying yes or no, and the Greek here doesn't help you. For those of you who think original languages are going to solve all their problems, all the Greek here says is it says you should say yes, yes, or no, no. So if your translation says something different, that's why. It just, it just like doubles up, like, like the writer stuttered for a second and wrote the same word. Like it just says yes, yes, or no, no. That somehow saying yes, yes, or no, no is righteous, but saying I promise, or I vow, or I swear is snaky. And, and when, he, when he brings up this evil one, you can start to build kind of two categories of ways that we can live, like a snaky life or a godly life. Maybe you could call it like a wicked life or a righteous life, a worldly life or a heavenly life, a harmful life or a helpful life, like when we break this down to kids level, a mean life or a kind life. H however you want to describe it, he starts to break into these two categories of there's one way of living that draws from trusting and following after God for the best life that you can have. And there's one way of living that, that draws away from trusting God, that trusts maybe yourself or trusts others or trusts what you read or trusts what you hear outside of God 
and thinks that's the way, and it draws you farther away from who you are intended to be and the way that you were intended to live and how God actually made you. And Jesus says right here in this moment of either saying yes, yes, or no, no, or saying I promise that we are given the choice between the righteous life and the snaky life. And my first question is, how? Right? That, th this feels like Jesus is talking about something really, really small, doesn't it? Like, he spends longer talking about promises than he spends talking about divorce. And, and, and I'm sitting there, like, lo looking at what Jesus is saying. I'm like, nah, Jesus, like, we got, we got some pretty big problems in the world. Don't you think maybe you should spend some of your time addressing some of those instead of this? Like, like Jesus, I... I is it like, help me out here. I'm trying to understand why are we spending so much time talking about this? Because it, what he's talking about is not making promises. And I want you to think for a second. Do you feel like throughout your life, people making promises to you, and, and not, not keeping promises, but making promises at all, has been a very harmful thing in your life? When you're listing the top things that have gone wrong in your life, it's, it's that people have made you promises. And, and not that they made promises that they broke just that they made promises. Does that feel like that's been one of the most harmful or hurtful things in your life, people making promises? Some people say yes. Some people would say no. What, what about, like, if you're listing the top 50 problems in the world? You're listing that, like, the top, and Jesus talks about somewhere around 50 things in the Sermon on the Mount. You're listing out the top 50 problems in the world. Does people making promises, and not just not keeping promises, but making promises at all, does that feel like that makes your list for the top 50 problems in the world, people making promises? Some of us, yes. Some of us, maybe not so much. It's okay. That's okay to be at that place in church when you're, you're looking at what Jesus is saying and you're like, I really don't understand. And, and, and it forces you to ask this question of like, hey, why is making a promise even bad? And again, not not keeping promises. We can all understand why not keeping promises is bad, right? Do we, do we need to spend time discussing? No, like, we all know why not keeping promises would be an unhelpful thing in your life and in your relationships. But asking the question, like, why is making a promise bad? That one feels like a harder one. And for that, we get to jump into some... Anybody? History! Yes! So I will put on my historian's jacket to be able to talk about this. And, and we're not just going to talk about any history, and I'll put on my historian's glasses. We're not going to talk about any history. We're going to talk about some really, really old history today. Uh, not like not like American history old, not like European history old. We're like we're like going really far back. We're the earliest history that we're talking about. We're, we're talking about something that we call Bible times, right? Has anyone ever heard this phrase, Bible times? Here's the issue with the word Bible times. It refers to so long. Bible times covers so much time, and when we talk about it like it's one time, we get confused into thinking that it's all the same, but it's not. Like, the closest history that we're going to talk about when we talk about Bible times is like 2,000 years ago. It's like year 60, right? It, it, if you want some reference, that's eight United States of Americas ago. That is eight times farther back in history than our country has even existed. And that's like the, the newest of the Bible times. The oldest of the Bible times is like year negative 1500. If we're just talking about like Moses, if you want to get into Genesis, then we can argue about young earth or new earth. I don't really care. But like, like if we're just talking about like Moses and Abraham, we're talking about like negative year 1500. And in case you were wondering, the span that Bible times covers, did anyone do, do the math? How many US, United States is it? It's like, it's like six. The Bible covers as much time as like six times the length of the country that we live in. And, and things over that time change. Things over that time are not always the same. And so sometimes we talk about like back in Bible times, it was like this. And it's like, well, which part of Bible times are we talking about? And so let's jump for a moment, like 3,500 years into the past. Does that sound good to everybody? Like, like if we're going back to the beginning of Bible times and, and we get this promise where Jesus said, uh, Jesus said, he said, you've heard it said uh, when, when you promise to keep your oath, right? And he's kind of mixing and matching a couple of Bible verses. There's this one in Leviticus that says, do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of the Lord, uh, uh, the name of your God, I am the Lord. And so kind of the main thrust there is what? When you promise by God, do it. When you make a promise, finish fulfilling that promise. And, and he's kind of drawing maybe from a psalm where it says this, fulfill your vows to the Most High. 
So again, when you make a promise to God, what should you do? Whatever that promise is, you should make sure that you do that. And, 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 and there is this thing that people did in, in the ancient world, like 3,500 years ago. There's this thing that people did where they would make a promise, they would make a vow, and they would base that upon God. And, and it normally followed some sort of a structure like, let God do blank. No, not yet. Let God do blank to me if I don't do blank. And that was just like a thing that people did. That was just a way that we kept our word to each other. Because if you're thinking about it, if we're jumping 3,500 years in the past, we're living in a time when there aren't really judges. There's not really an advanced legal system. There's no investigative news at 11 that will uncover the secrets of how someone lied to you. There are people's words. And one of the ways that they made that promise is they would make a promise based on God. And, and we read this. We actually get an example of this in Scripture, in the book of Ruth, right? Does anyone remember this in Ruth? It's like weird when she says this. If you don't know that people just make promises by God, she says, where you die, I'll die, and there I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. And you're like, Ruth, I don't know where that came from. But that's, that's legitimately just one of the ways that people would talk to each other. People would make promises, and they kept those promises. By, it was like one of the ways that, that society functioned was that people made these oaths and these promises and they kept to it. And, and can you think of any other stories in Scripture where this happens? Like, and sometimes those oaths ended up being a helpful thing, right? In, in Ruth, they helped someone stay true to their widowed mother-in-law and take care of her. That's a, that's a big good thing, isn't it? To take care of your widowed mother. Like, this isn't even your mother. This isn't even, like, this is your ex-husband's mom, and you're like, no, you're family now. And, and Ruth makes this promise. Other times the promises go wildly wrong, right? Where some guy's like, I'm going to sacrifice to God the first thing that comes out of my house. And it is not a good thing. You can look that up on your own. Like, we're not going in any particular order, but, but this is just how the world operated. There's this one time where the Israelites are wandering around, and, and this group of people are like, I know, we'll get a promise out of the Israelites. Let's dress up like we're from far away. And we'll put on old shoes and old robes, and it'll look like we've come from a long way. And they're like, hey, Israelites, we came from far away. Can you make a pact with us that we're going to be friends forever, right? And the Israelites are like, yeah, that's fine. That doesn't bother us. We only care about, like, this land. And then after they're like, I promise by my God that I will be good to you, they're like, joke's on you. I live next door. I'm your neighbor. you got to be nice to me now. Like, these O's and these promises get wildly out of hand, but when, when you look at them, Right in the beginning of Scripture, like, it, it's not that Jesus, it's not that God is necessarily against all oaths. He starts by just saying, God starts by just saying, be true to your oath. When you make an oath, keep it. And, and, and this, part of this is because that's how kind of society operated, was that there was this idea of divine punishment, where if I break this promise, it's going to come back against me. And when there is no law, and there is no legal system, and there is no police who are going to come, and there is no one who's going to stand on your side, maybe a divine promise is the thing that can actually help us be honest and true and upright to each other. Don't hear Jesus saying that what God said in the Old Testament was wrong. Maybe what he's saying is that we need to read this and do this in a different way now. Because it's not just that they're making a promise based on divine punishment. It's also a little bit that they're like borrowing from God's credibility. They're saying like, hey, I'm going to do this, and you can trust me that I'm going to do this as much as you trust that God is, righteousness, that God is righteous. I'm going to do this, and you can trust that I'm going to do this as much as you trust that God is in control or God is sovereign. Because if I don't do this, that righteous, that sovereign God is going to come to get me. Like, we don't do this, right? But if I'm like, hey, Ash, that's my wife's name, hey, Ashley, I promise that I will take the trash out, and if I don't, may God smite me. <laughs> Husbands, this is bad advice, because there's really only two things that are going to happen. No matter what, you're going to forget to take out the trash. And the one side is God smites you. The other side is you ended up making a bad promise. Like, 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 that is not how we operate anymore, but, but there's something about that promise that, that, that manipulates another person to trust us like they would trust God. We're done with the history portion of today's lesson. Almost. There's a little bit more. But for like a thousand years, that's how the world operates. This is how long 
This is legitimately how long Bible times is. Is that I talked about something, and for a thousand years that happened that way, and there's still 600 years for there to be a different thing to happen. For like a thousand years, people talked that way, and then they, uh, the Jews decided that it feels disrespectful to use God's name. That name, Yahweh, that God gave Moses is not the name that we should use anymore. Like, when they read scripture and it says Yahweh, they would just say Adonai, they would just say Lord, because it felt disrespectful to say God's name. And so, of course, this whole system of swearing by God's name, that's got to change too, because I can't, I can't swear by God's name if I can't say God's name. And so they make this elaborate system of swearing by some things and not other things. And you can almost rank the things that they swear by the things that are closer or farther away from God. And if I swear by something that's more worthy and closer to God, then I really, really need to keep my word. But if I swear by something that's farther away from God, then maybe I don't need to keep my word as much. And this grows over like 600 years until Jesus' time when he actually uh, calls out the Pharisees for this exact thing. Maybe some of you remember this passage. This is later on in the same book in Matthew where he calls them blind guides. Just wait a second. He calls them blind guides and blind fools. He tells them that they swear by the altar and think that that's lesser than swearing by the gifts of the altar. Or they swear by the temple and think that that's lesser than swearing by the gold of the temple. And he's like, you're twisting all of this in your head. And frustratingly, he gives a different set of advice in Matthew 23 than he does in Matthew 5. Here's what he says in Matthew 23. Anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and the one who sits on it. It's almost as if he's like, guys, this, this issue of us making these twisted promises to each other to mislead and misguide and manipulate one another is not the way that we should do it. And in Matthew 5, it, it almost feels like he stands up like a parent who's given their kids a little bit too much freedom, and they took all of the freedom, and they're like, no more! You make no more promises ever again. Parents, have you been in this moment? You know this moment, right? No more! And in Matthew 25, it feels more like he's like, no, don't you realize that whatever promise you make, you should treat that the same as you made that promise to God, and you should be true and honest to your word that you should not find loopholes to try and make one promise that, that one person hears something, but I'm going to do something else. It would be as if I went to Carrie and I'm like, hey, Carrie, can I get 20 bucks? I promise by the church I'll pay it back. And he's like, yeah, sure, by the church. I'll pay it back. Two months pass. And Carrie's like, where's my money? I'm like, haha, I promise by the church and not the steeple. <laughs> so I'm going to keep that money. Like, it, it, Promises and swearing oaths turned into this system where it was made so I could manipulate and mislead someone else to get the thing that I want regardless of the cost to the relationship or regardless of the cost to them. And at this point, it, it becomes easy when you, when you pick up on some of this history to see why Jesus is saying that these oaths have become snake-like, that these oaths have become twisted that these oaths have become sinful because they're about using people to get what I want. They're about using relationships to get what I want. They're about borrowing God's credibility so that someone trusts me so that I can get what I want. And Jesus is like, that is not the way that we operate anymore, guys. And, and we talked a couple weeks ago about a big word. Uh, actually, last week. Does anyone remember the big word? Herm. Hermeneutics. Yes, we talked about a word, hermeneutics, which is just how you interpret things. And we talked kind of about two sides of the pole for hermeneutics, that the one side was like a plain text and the other side was like a nuanced reading. That a plain text reading of this passage probably just says, hey, don't ever make promises. Whatever you do, the thing that you should not do is say, I promise. And a nuanced reading probably tries to draw into account some of the context. Some of the other things that, that, yes, it's probably talking about promises, but it's probably also talking about other times that I mislead or manipulate people. And then we take this way of reading, and we're going to talk about this week, uh, uh, ways that we apply. And sometimes they go along with how we read and how we interpret, but ways that we apply. The first way I'm going to say uh, is the way we apply normally uh, applies with um, plain text. And these are my words. These are not like scholarly words. But we would apply it broadly. And what that means is I think of any time that what I'm doing could be called a promise. And since I know that promises are bad, I am not going to make those promises. Another way to call this might be legalistically. Like that's kind of how the Pharisees did it, if that's what you were wondering. That they were like, oh, it's bad to do work on the Sabbath, so I'm going to figure out everything that's work, and then I'm not going to do all the things that are work, so I'm not going to light fires on the Sabbath. 
But, but we do this sometimes, right? We think of, well, what are all the times that we make promises? Well, I make a promise when I say I promise. So I'm not going to say I promise. I'm definitely not going to say I swear to God. Uh, I'm not going to testify under oath because they asked me to take an oath. Like, uh, maybe I'm not going to sign a contract. Maybe I'm not going to do marriage vows in the same way because that's too close to a promise. And the thing is, when we apply Scripture broadly like this, we feel ourselves more righteous and more holy in every small place that we could find a way that everyone else promises, and we're like, nah, uh I'm not going to promise that way. Everyone else says, on God, and we're like, I'm not going to say that. Like, we find little ways that this feels like it applies, and we're like, I am good for not doing this thing. And then the other side is like a nuanced reading where we try and take into account all the things that are happening and realize that maybe this is somewhat about manipulating people, somewhat about misleading people. And so it's not just about not saying, I promise. Maybe that's part of it, but it's more than that. And and we get to a a type of application, a type of practice that I'm going to call deeply. And again, these are Dan's words, not scholarly words. But it's that way of applying it that's not just saying, this is the rule, I will apply the rule, done, dusted, moved on. Maybe another way to describe this is wisely, because it takes discernment to try and figure out how we're going to do this, right? And so maybe that means that I'm going to try and be forthcoming instead of misleading, right? Maybe it means that I'm not going to use God as my trump card anymore to say, well, the, like, the, I heard God tell me this, so we can't argue about it anymore, I I know that the Bible said this, so we can't argue about it anymore. Maybe the other person reads something differently, and and we can be in an open and honest and vulnerable conversation. Like, I spent a lot of time trying to to piece out what this actually looks like. Because when you do this kind of deeper righteousness thing, it takes time to figure out where in my heart I am breaking this rule, and where in my life I am hurting others in this way. And it's like, maybe I need to be, I don't know, humble, instead of like religiously manipulative. Maybe it means that like I need to not manipulate, but instead be collaborative. Again, it took me a while. I I sat with Ashley this week, and I was like, hey, what's the opposite of manipulate? And we're like, I don't don't know. That one's a hard one. But but I think if what the the Pharisees and, and Israelites at that time are doing is that they are making promises to coerce and strong arm someone else into doing a thing that I want or to trusting me in a way that I want, then the opposite side of that is being willing to go to them honestly and vulnerably and be collaborative, even if I don't agree with or or don't like the thing that's going to happen, even if I don't get what I want out of it. Like when we actually start to tease out what this deeper righteousness is, it doesn't fit in an easy rule book, does it? It makes me start to ask, like, like how, how do I do that in this circumstance? And that's why the Bible is not just a list of rules. When we go to the Bible just expecting a list of rules, we find ourselves frustrated that it's not what we want it to be, but it's not that. It's a a group of stories of people's lives who trust God and follow God either well or poorly, and we get to learn from some of them, and there are rules that draw us into this deeper life. It's why the Word became flesh, that we get to see what it looks like when God lives at a person in all of his many and varied interactions. It's why when Jesus does the same thing that Moses did in the Old Testament, he doesn't send down stone tablets with rules that are beyond contestation. If you notice what he does is he talks to his disciples. And then those disciples go down as if they are the law being lived out. That by their word and by their actions, people can know what that deeper righteousness is like. And I warned you at the front end that I was going to ask you a question for where we're going to close. And your question is still on the table of what is the deeper righteousness. I have some things written down that I can mention, but part of the joy of a small group, part of the joy of a Sunday school class with our kids, part of the joy of youth group with our students is that they come up with ideas that are led and guided by the Spirit that I would never have come up with no matter how many hours of study I spent. As you heard me speak this morning, did anything come up that feels like this is a deeper righteousness. Another way of phrasing that is just this. What should we do? Based on what Jesus said, it's not just finding anywhere where we're making a promise and to not say I promise or I oath or I vow. Anyone? What was something that came out that felt like it was a deeper righteousness to you? I'm going to walk out from the pulpit so you don't think that I'm preaching anymore. And remember that I work in youth and children's ministry, so I am used to silence. It's why I brought coffee. What's that? 
Love God and serve his people. Right? That it's not just about not making oaths. It's about not... Sometimes I feel like when we feel like there's a rule, I don't want to break the rule because I know that I'm not supposed to break the rule. And it's like, no, I don't want to break the rule because I know that that hurt, hurts people and harms people. And I want to serve his people. And I want to love God. That's a great one. What else? And then come out that felt like it was a deeper righteousness for you today? A way that we can actually live that out? Yeah. Unconditional commitment to serving others. And to others, right? That, that we can let our word be our bond. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Hmm. Trusting God. Because here's the thing. We may not make promises by Yahweh, but our culture has a lot of our own ways to manipulate and get our way, doesn't it? We have a lot of ways that we do that on our own. And when we trust in God that his way is better, then maybe the next time I'm calling Comcast on the phone, I think about if I'm being forthright or I'm being manipulative to get my way. The next time I want to make a return outside of the return window, I think about if I'm being forthcoming or if I'm trusting God. Anyone else have a deeper righteousness that they felt like drew out for them today? What's happening? You're good. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, like just being honest. Whether that's on the good side or the bad side. We talked about this in our small group. That sometimes we make a promise and we feel so locked into it and so stressed out of it. When, when sometimes life circumstances happen that you can't fulfill that promise anymore. And you need to go to that person vulnerably and honestly and say like, hey, I can't do this. I will help you find a way to get this done, but it can't be me. And sometimes promises lock us into not being able to be honest when we can't be everything. Anybody else felt like there was a deeper righteousness today? I was thinking about it through the lens of, of families. What about giving trust? A lot of times we talk about how trust is earned, but how often do we as parents, or do we as people in control, almost force the other person to make a promise because they say something, and we give them that look. You know that look. That look that says, I don't trust you, but I don't want to call you a liar to your face. What if we, uh, as grown-ups, made the choice to, to trust people so that it di people didn't feel like they had to give us a promise for them to be trusted? Or conversely, what if, how many times have we done this to our parents, kids, where you told them something, but you haven't always told them the truth, and so they gave you a look, and you know that look. That look that says, I don't trust you, but I don't want to call you a liar to your face. And so you say, I promise, because you're like, no, now I'm actually telling the truth. Those other times, I wasn't actually telling the truth. Now I am. What if we, what if we acted like people that, that we were worthy of trust, whether we said promise or not? When we start to parse out what is that deeper righteousness, when we start to pick apart what it means that God calls us to a better life, it is not as simple as stop making promises. That's part of it. But it touches on honesty. It touches on the way that we interact with service people or our families. It touches on the ways that we care for our spouse. When, when we start reading scripture this way, it stops becoming a list of rules and it starts becoming an entryway or a passageway into a wider and deeper and greater life that God has for us. And we start becoming people who are not built like the snake, but start becoming people who are shaped like Christ. We start becoming a community that becomes shaped like heaven. And I don't know if you feel this here, but I feel this here very often. I feel this here in this room, but also in our small group when like, we have people from wildly different backgrounds who this week someone said, I think there's just a fundamental disagreement in the room. And that didn't cause rifts or issues, but that caused us to bind together and listen to each other honestly and vulnerably more. I don't know if you feel that, but, but we are ever more becoming that community that is Jesus-shaped, that is heaven-shaped, not because we never make mistakes, but because we live founded on the grace that God gives us. And we try and live the greater life that he has for us so that we can finally be what we were always meant to be, people who are shaped like Jesus. And all of that starts at this table. All of that starts at communion. All of this deeper righteousness is not more things that you need to put on your to-do list so that you can make sure that you're doing all of those things right. It starts with God's grace and God's forgiveness and the Spirit's power in your life. 
So as David comes up and leads us in communion, and you come up and you take these elements, this is not just bread and juice today. Let this be a reminder to you of the ways that God's grace and God's forgiveness and God's power gives you a better life.